David Peterson, the creator of Mouse Guard, and welcome to Creator Commentary for the second series of Mouse Guard, Winter 1152. This episode will cover issue number three, or chapter three, when it was collected into a hardcover edition. For this issue, I'll be doing the commentary as audio only, but please feel free to follow along in your copy of the story, in either issue form or from the hardcover, as I talk about the behind-the-scenes details, art notes, and my headspace as I go page by page and panel by panel. Also, a fair warning, there will be spoilers if you have not yet read this or the rest of the Mouse Guard series. I started work on drawing this issue in October of 2007. Like previous issues, this one takes place in three locations, Lock Haven, the Snowy Wilderness, and Dark Heather. And each location serves a different part to storytelling. The Lock Haven scenes push the plot narrative, the winter scenes are talky exposition, and the Dark Heather pages are more about action. More on those as we come to them. Cover. As the cover for issue one featured all the main characters, and then issue two focused on Kelena and Liam, I decided issue three's cover should star the mice down in Dark Heather, Kenzie, Sadie, and Saxon. I remember struggling with the layout of this cover at an art night gathering where Jeremy Bastion and Nate Pride were hanging out drawing together with me. Nate sketched up a quick idea of a bird's eye, or I guess in this case a bat's eye view, where we are up with Saxon on the flying bat looking down on Sadie and Kenzie in a swirl of bats. Looking back at his sketch and my finished cover, I can say that his was better. The only justification I have for it is that I knew my next cover for issue number four would also be featuring Saxon, but alone, so I didn't want to give him the prominence two issues in a row. I wish I'd done more with this cover, either defined the bats more than the mass of black shape or done something with the background, other than the pebbly purple color. Inside front cover. The bring the reader up to speed text here is pretty straightforward as I recap the last issue. I'd received some criticism for adding story moments into these text blocks in fall, so for winter, I tried very hard to just restate what already happened. The spot illustration of the ice-encased branches certainly is a foreshadowing of events in this issue with Kalanaw and Liam. Every line here, with the exception of the border, is color-held. That's where I paint the line work to be a color other than black. The white of the ice and the dark purple of the branches were separated onto two separate layers in Photoshop so I could isolate them and paint them separately. The poem is again by Roybin the Scribe, a character introduced through a fan contest and won by Laurie Johnson. This poem about secrets is meant to reference the true tale of the Black Axe. And further to that point, I titled it as being an excerpt from The Ballad of M of Appleloft, a character I didn't have imagined at this point, but later I pulled from this line to be a major player in the third Mouse Guard book, The Black Axe. Page 1. The outline for this page and the next just say, Gwendolyn locks down Lockhaven, with the notation that it should take two pages to do this. The page opens with an establishing shot of Lockhaven buried in snow, as it did when we last saw it in issue 1. Panel 2. Landra the quartermaster, filling in for Rand, sits at his familiar alcove office. The mechanism for the portcullis is seen off to the left, not just to help readers establish where we currently are in Lockhaven, but also that that chain-driven pulley will come into play on the next page. In addition to the maps and pawns and abacus and candle stubs on Lander's desk, I also added a box of yet unlit candles behind her desk. Panel 3. To achieve the nice font and have it curve with the curl of the note while still looking hand-inked, I printed out a copy of this note with a typed font, distressed it and rolled it, and then photographed my hands trying to keep it unrolled. With the page on a light box, I was able to ink over a printout of the photograph to get the text and curl just right, while still further distressing the paper and calligraphy in the artwork. Panel 4. Here I introduce the guard mouse Isabel. She is meant to represent my wife Julia's youngest sister Ashley, while Landra represents Julia's middle sister Kim. Ashley was a zookeeper at the time, so when planning an out-of-doors guard mouse who would have the best affinity for interacting with other species like hares, Ashley came to mind. The symbol on her tunic is meant to be something like a compass rose, implying that she travels by hare regularly. 
Another hidden item on the floor, the top book in the stack, is a slip-cased copy of the Mouse Guard Fall Black and White Edition. Page 2, Panel 1. Isabel's red cloak should have told you something about her temperament. She has an impatient streak that is meant to play off of Landra's cool demeanor, kind of an echo of Saxon and Kenzie. The sealing up of Lockhaven at Gwendolyn's command begins. Here is why I needed to show that mechanism on the previous page. Panel 2. Even though I didn't build my early paper models to last, luckily not enough time had passed between using the portcullis model from the end of fall until this point when I was drawing Winter Issue 3, so I could still use this model for reference before it bit the dust. Panel 3. To further seal Lockhaven, Landra locks the door with access to the gate's controls with a key. The route Isabel references, for those of you looking at the Mouse Guard Territories map, takes them southeast to Mouse Cities I had not yet referenced in Mouse Guard in dialogue or with a visit. When working on the Mouse Guard RPG, I made it official that Saxon and Kenzie both grew up in this area, Saxon being from Flintrust and Kenzie being from Willow Root. While researching for this commentary, I found a note with some unused dialogue for this part. Isabel says in that unused dialogue, It took three days to convince the hares to give us aid. Now I'm to tell them that they are prisoners of Lockhaven? I think it was scrapped because it just made more argument here when I wanted to push on to the next scene in Gwendolyn's office. Panel 4. Architecturally speaking, I don't yet have a clear picture, still, of how all these bits of Lockhaven I've drawn fits together, or what rooms and hallways connect them. But for this moment of Landra's trip further to seal Lockhaven, I cobbled together some photo reference of one archway and stairway into this longer section where I repeated the arches and stair sections. On a light box, I was able to ink following the geometry and perspective of the photo collage, but still add texture and differences between the architecturally similar parts so that it looked purposeful. Page 3. This page is a vertical mirror of the previous page's layout. Here we are back inside Gwendolyn's office. Looking at my pencils, I didn't use a model to trace from to do any of the layouts for this page, but I suspect I looked at my office model for reference to frame these panels. None of the guard mice here are anyone special save for Gwendolyn, Isabel, and in the back with the hat is Quigley. He's the lookout mouse from Chapter 5 of Fall. On the mantle sits the teapot listed as an example of pottery in the extras guide pages of the Fall hardcover. Panel 2. If it wasn't obvious from the dialogue of Panel 1, here in Panel 2 it becomes obvious that Gwendolyn is searching for Abigail the healer and now poisoner. Rand in this panel is still looking poor of health, the change of accommodations from bed in the apothecary with a fire nearby to a cold, hidden, circular stairwell certainly can't be helping, but I guess it needs to be put in perspective with also being out of his poisoner's reach. When Kellenaw exploited the circular staircase at the end of fall to access Gwendolyn's office through the revolving portrait, I meant for it to be clear that guard mice don't know about this passage, so only the mice in Gwendolyn's office at the end of fall now know. So this location is Gwendolyn's best spot to hide Rand. Panel 3. The top-down perspective not only allowed me to change up the camera angle for variety, but also helped place where Rand is in physical relationship to the rest of the mice meeting in Gwendolyn's office. That hallway leading in the direction off the top of the panel, behind Gwendolyn's dialogue, is something not really established well in any of the drawings of the office at the end of fall. I'm not sure, other than to make this room more interesting, why I started drawing it here on this page. But in the third book, The Black Axe, that passage leads to a very special room, the Matriarch's Chamber. Panel 4. And with Gwendolyn spelling it out for her guard mice and the reader that Rand's poisoning was done by Abigail, she here orders her mice to hunt down the villain. Note that the mice closest to Gwendolyn with their weapons showing are archers. Checking back in my outline for the series, I did have Abigail's life ending by getting struck with an arrow. So I was setting the stage for that event, even here in issue 3. Page 4, panel 1. The return to Kellanaw and Liam in the middle of that horrible ice storm that started in the last issue. 
I chose the establishing shot to be very wide with the mice just dots for a sense of how hopeless their scale is in this horrible weather. The tree branch encased in ice in the foreground not only helps with the scale, but also was a way to make sense of the visuals that I was going to show on the mice in the coming panels. Panel 2. To show how dire their situation is, I wanted those icicles that were forming around Kelena's muzzle in issue 2 to now be covering them. All their loose fur is frozen with icicles forming wherever the sleet drips off their fur. It looks a bit odd here because I didn't lighten the color holds on the icicles compared to their non-frozen bits. And as a result, I think they look a little bit more like melting candles rather than ice-encased mice. Panel 3. As the pair start to crack the ice crust on the snow to dig a shelter, I use a little lettering trick to imply Liam is shivering so much that he's stuttering. Panel 4. A panel reminiscent of the digging the group did in issue 1 to avoid the snowy plain and route to Spruce Tuck. However, here there seems to be more urgency as they are fighting for their survival. Page 5, panel 1. I remembered the scene in the movie My Side of the Mountain, a book and movie I've referenced before in the commentary, when Sam nearly dies overnight in his tree home because the doorway has been snowed over and there's not enough oxygen getting in. So even though the main shaft Liam and Kelena dug should provide enough air, I liked adding in this survival detail of mouse hovel building safety. Panel 2. This tighter shot of the candle lighting also shows a close-up of the little box Kelenaw has on his belt with fire lighting supplies kept dry. Some punky wood that will light easily and smolder, a bit of flint pointing up there, and either he has another bit of steel in the box or he used the axe or Liam's sword to strike the spark. Panel 3. Sealing the ceiling of a snow cave with a candle to ice it over for support and insulation is something I remember reading about in the scouting magazine Boy's Life when I was a kid. As Kellenaw uses their last bit of candle to do this, he's glad to see that Liam is paying attention to the little details of survival and supplies. A pleased mentor already deciding that this mouse could be the next Black Axe. Pages 6 and 7. This two-page back-and-forth conversation was something I'd planned from the start of this issue. In my synopsis prepping for the winter series, I wanted to not only build this mentor-mentee relationship between Kellen and Liam, but I wanted to address a lot of the questions brought up in fall on these pages and the next few. I regret that between the two pages here, the panel layout could be confusing to read to some if they read straight across the binding, since the panels line up but you are meant to read all the panels on page 6 before proceeding to page 7. Anyhow, I think the layout still implies both an intimacy of conversation and setting, along with there being some metaphorical distance between the characters. The first major topic mentioned is the guard motto, it matters not what you fight, but what you fight for. I worried about how this sentiment could be boiled down to the ends justify the means if perverted, so Kelena brings out this argument, pointing out that Midnight fought his own kind, his own order, to bring about what he fought for. Next up is Liam asking the question about the impossibility of Kelena being the mythic figure, the Black Axe, and Kelena does the classic mentor trick of answering a question with a question, one that implies you already should have the answer. But with Liam still on the fence and afraid of both possibilities, Kelena very willingly gives him the answer. I am, truly. The artwork here, while fairly simple to ink, was much harder to color. The walls of the snow cave were color held with one color, while the icicles clinging to their fur were separated on another layer to be a different color. It was a lot of painting in and establishing what line work would be which of either color and which would stay black. Page 8. Panels 1 through 3. This panel and the next have mirroring flashbacks from Kelena's past. These first three are to answer how Midnight came to have the axe, a question both I and readers had wondered. Unfortunately, I'm not sure how good of a job I did at explaining it. Midnight in the shadows with a bottle while a spilled tankard is next to Kelena's hammock was kind of meant to imply that Midnight had drugged him. Now, how Midnight ever located Kelena or that... He had the axe isn't clear. Though we do know that M's book From the Black Axe, chronicling its lore as well as the events of that book up until her death, 
is the very book Midnight is referencing in Fall when he said he found proof of the axe being real and not just being a legend. So perhaps that helped him know who to track down. Midnight's ability to be unseen in shadows due to his fur color is used here to also explain his getting the drop on Kelena, something Midnight was known to do when Conrad saw him in Fall but couldn't make him out in the shadows. The mention of Midnight being the only mouse who is not the Black Axe to have wielded it and not been bitten by its blade, though Kelenaw was ready to at the end of Fall if Gwendolyn hadn't stopped him. It's not so much about trying to point out how Midnight was unique, but it's a casual suggestion that there have been more than one Black Axe, something I spell out much more clearly in the third volume, The Black Axe. I wasn't ready to go into it here, but I needed it to be a possibility in the minds of readers to prepare them for the events at the end of this book. Panel 4. Liam is shocked to hear Kellanaw suggest that anything Midnight did or thought could be agreed with. I tried to capture that here with his body language, his eye shape, and also those little arrow lines that are near his face. Kind of an ah expression. Page 9, panel 1. And in this panel and the last, Kelenaw explains that the role of Black Axe is as a solitary creature who is without specific allegiance to any mouse, but instead to mouse kind. He's coming back to this greater good comment he used in the last issue, but as the creator of this series, I put forward that interpretation over either of those sentiments is the key. That just as it matters not what you fight, etc. can be perverted to justify terrible actions, so can these words of Kelenaw's. It all depends on what you think is the greater good. Panel 2. Back to a series of flashbacks. This first one solidifying that Kelenaw was involved in the outcome of the Weasel War of 1149, something Saxon brought into question in Fall Issue 5, though this panel doesn't make it clear how Kelenaw was involved in the Weasel War yet. That ferret in the front is the first appearance of a character that readers have yet to meet, but will in the Weasel War though I draw him and his costuming a bit different now. Panel 3. This flashback is showing something guard mice actively avoid, unless they cannot any longer, which is to initiate combat or force predators prior to the predator doing so. Guard mice use deterrence to keep the territory's predator free, or find pathways that lead around dens and nests. Here, Kalanaw, with a thorn-studded rope, is using the role of the black axe to run them out or slay them. Panel 4. And lastly, an implication that seems too big to be true, that a mouse could shape the landscape. But I have ways in my head that Kelena isn't boasting or embellishing here. I don't have any specific tales in mind for what this is, but I do have ideas of how I could make this work if I ever needed to. Page 10. Panel 1. A wide top-down shot of the pair helped me fit in all the dialogue so that it could be read clearly. Out of the flashbacks and back here into the snow cave, Liam points out why he has disbelief, questions fans had been bringing up to me ever since Kelenaw first appeared in Fall. Now, Kelenaw doesn't lie here, but he doesn't give the whole truth either. It was meant to be a very Obi-Wan Kenobi moment, from a certain point of view. I found some unused dialogue that got edited out from this scene, where Kelenaw implies that in the spring, he was going to be turning away from the guard, that he'd strayed from the guard's path a long time ago. But I think this published version works better. It says enough, but also saves that Kelenaw backstory for the Black Axe. Panel 2. The close-up panel here I think was originally meant to have a different beat of dialogue, perhaps the last portion from panel 1, but I'm guessing I had to shift some of the text from panel 3 over to this panel to get everything to fit properly. Panel 3. And here we have another classic mentor line. You'll be told what you need to know when you need to hear it. Again, it's no lie. The information here is given to Liam, eventually, and perhaps that was the right time for him to know it. Page 11. This is a 180-degree rotation of the previous page's panel layout. Panel 1. Like the framing of the last panel on the previous page, we have the foreground character in the very close reverse angle. Liam is impatient and wants to know now something I assumed the reader would also be thinking or saying. But Kalanaw's reply, which I always hear in Ian McKellen's Gandalf voice, manages to not spoil the much larger tale, but also keeps up that mentor habit of being a bit playfully condescending. 
I also worried, and spoiler alert here, with this dialogue that I had given away that Kelenal wasn't going to survive this tale. That he would never get around to actually telling the story to Liam personally. Panel 2. Ah, the ear scar. I'll admit, I had something in mind for how Liam got it when I wrote this part, but I have since changed my mind and mentally rewritten the ear cutting. Either way, it's meant to elude, like Kelenaw's, a larger origin story. Panel 3. Boy, that cave certainly has gotten bigger since I established it on page 5. Whoops. I still like this wordplay with the idea of keeping secrets and keeping warm. Another line hard not to hear in that Ian McKellen Gandalf voice. Page 12. Like I said at the start of the issue, the Lockhaven scenes were to drive some plot, the talky snow scenes were to develop character, and here back in Dark Heather, we're going for the action. Panel 1. Hidden mostly in shadow, read that as cheat to not have to draw elaborate architecture, I re-established Saxon, Kenzie, and Sadie in Dark Heather. At the end of the last issue, I'd shown the bats on the ceiling, but since I didn't want the characters to react yet, I hid them from view by giving the reader basically the bat's point of view. Bickering between Saxon and Kenzie clearly hasn't resolved in the half-issue we've been away from them, and they are pointing out the flaws they see in each other, while Sadie makes a pointed remark, mentioning couple relationships, again, my clumsy attempts to be subtle as I eventually pair Kenzie and Sadie. Panel 2. And Kenzie's reply here takes the squabble to a more humorous banter level, or at least that's what I wanted to do. But it doesn't really matter, since Sadie has now discovered what we already know. Page 13, panel 1. Bats. Implying that the entire ceiling is full of bats in the dark meant I only had to draw the line of bats that we were closest to and imply the silhouettes of the rest as they go back further with the negative space. Color helped me make those inks make more sense, but making the silhouettes pretty dark, so they receded. Panel 2. Kenzie's words here are a plot point I'd considered for a mouse guard story at one point, where something is attacking a mouse town, soon to be discovered to be bats, but that only adds to the mystery is bats aren't mouse eaters. And in that story, the reason had to do with fruit stores that were attracting gnats. Not a great tale. But here, Kenzie is also trying to establish facts while reassuring the reader that they are not in any predatory danger. Well, not exactly. Panel 3. I referenced a photo of a real bat when drawing this panel, but I see now I clearly took some artistic liberties. Ones I'll take further in the following bat pages. The bat's word balloon shape and font is meant to imply the sound of their voice, but so is the color of the balloon. It doesn't stand out as brightly as the mouse balloons. It's almost like a loud whisper. Page 14, panel 1. By this stage, I'd made myself a model of this prominent arch formation based on the architecture seen in issue 2. The arch model is made of three-quarter inch rigid insulation foam and dowels as pillars. I was able to move that to odd angles to get all the various views I needed for this sequence, even though they are mostly covered by bats or shadows. Panel 2. Here's one of those odd angles. Even though I think after inking in the shadows almost everywhere in the background, I went back and used white correction fluid to paint in all the bats on the original inked page. Panel 3. Saxon's accusations really upsets this bat. On the next page and the pages after, I go into the why. Again, I referenced a real bat photo I found online to help me with this panel, though, again, anatomical liberties with the face. Panel 4. The characterization of this panel still pleases me, as does the echo of Saxon's cloak to the bat's wing from the above panel. But this foreshortened mouse face looks wrong to me. It's really flat. Page 15. This page is a mirror of the previous page's layout. Panel 1. Like the flying monkeys leaving the witch's castle in the Wizard of Oz, so too go the bats from Dark Heather's arches. I have, may have been a little too silhouette or shape happy here. I think partly because of my love of Mike Mignola's work, but also because I didn't have the confidence at that time to draw the bats well enough and still make sense of the mass of them, as well as all the architecture. Panels 2 and 3. The reaction panels are divided so that Saxon is alone and Kenzie and Sadie are together, something to foreshadow not only the upcoming events of the battle with the bats, 
but also the relationship I'm trying to form between Kenzie and Sadie. The scale of the bats in these panels seems off here. They're too small in relation to the mice. Panel 4. In this vertical panel, the bat's backstory begins. Again, I used bat reference, mostly to get the shapes of flying bat anatomy figured out, while also fitting in four separate bats to narrate. Pages 16 and 17. A two-page spread! This was my first time ever doing one in the pages of Mouse Guard. To get the architecture right, I locked down my digital camera on a tripod and then moved my one arch model to set distances measured out on the table, snapping a photo each time I moved it. Then in Photoshop, I could assemble the entire room, piecing the photos together. Though then I still had a lot of work to do to paste in all the tile patterns and trim to the layout before I could then ink it all. The story the bats are telling here is a version on the Aesop's fable of the bats not belonging to either land or sky. In the Aesop's version I read, the bats were offering allegiance to both land and sky at the same time, trying to hedge their bets. Here I wanted the bats to be a bit more sympathetic, that no one would ever trust them, even though they had done nothing wrong. Page 18, panel 1. In my original script, the order of Sadie and Kenzie's lines are switched, but rephrased so they make sense in that order. Not sure if I swapped the order before or after drawing this panel, but Sadie being on the left could have been my reason for moving the dialogue around. Panel 2. Even now that we know the bats aren't going after the mice for food or predator reasons, they're still far from safe, because the bats' motivation now is vengeance, and they are promising death. Panel 3. In my outline, Saxon shoves Kenzie aside out of the path of the incoming bat, but I think this comes off more like Saxon just being impetuous. I don't know if I drew it this way on purpose, or if I was just having a hard time getting the action line to show that Kenzie was being moved and saved. Panel 4. In my original outline, Saxon was supposed to use his cloak to snag the bat's neck while being carried off. Again, I don't know if I cut that due to extra panels it may have taken to show that action, or if because it makes more sense for Saxon just to be physically aggressive. Page 19. This page's panel layout is a mirror of the last page. For many years when I'd do a slideshow lecture at schools, libraries, or other events, I'd use this page as an example of my process, showing every step from outline and script through to the final colors. Panel 1. The hostage-style threat from Saxon feels like something a role-playing game party of heroes may use against a sentient dungeon dweller when lost in the deep. I can't seem to escape role-playing game storytelling in my work. This bat is one that I drew with no reference, and I think it shows, both for good and bad qualities. It's wrong anatomically, but also doesn't look as stiff and referenced as the other bats. Panels 2 and 3. The reference Saxon made to Kenzie's lantern on the staff being a basket of fire gets called back here. Kenzie is also keeping good on his declaration to Saxon a few pages ago that he's willing to fight his way out of Dark Heather now that there is no other option in this moment. Panel 4. Ouch for that bat! And also ouch for our heroes. That was their only light source. This is one of those effecty panels where it's hard to figure out how to draw something in line that is more about shape or light, like flames bursting out of a lantern and engulfing a bat as it gets hit with that lantern in the chest and it shatters. But this panel, like many before, are an example that Mouse Guard is my on-the-job training for how to draw comics. Page 20, panel 1. Hard to tell here, but I did try to mute and darken this page and the next after the lantern is out but I had to be careful so that the reader could still see what was happening. Sadie throwing her dagger towards the reader in a tall panel was a challenge, but with the size of the dagger and the action line, I was able to make it clear enough. Panel 2. And like in Winter, Issue 1, Sadie doesn't miss a critical hit. Panel 3. Sure, the physics don't add up that the mass of the bat hitting the stone arch would be enough to make it fall, but... As this place was once in a war and it's been three years neglected, there's some logical wiggle room to say that the arch was already in sorry shape and it only took the weight of a stabbed bat to make it crumble to pieces. Panel 4. As the chunk of archway falls away with a boom, 
publisher plug, the remaining bats start to scatter, including the bat carrying Saxon and the one still on fire from Kenzie's attack, which may explain why they aren't in complete darkness yet. Page 21. This page's layout matches the previous pages. Panels 1 through 3. This sequence is meant to go by very quickly. We get a good look at Saxon on the back of his captive bat, as he then pulls away further in the next panel, until the last panel where there's only a speck, and I colored it red for Saxon's cloak. Fans have asked why Saxon didn't just kill his bat, but I always assumed that either the height or the speed at which the bat was flying after the boom made that an equally dangerous decision, considering the fall he would take. Panel 4. Lastly on this page, the frightened reaction shots of Kenzie and Sadie near the rubble. I've dropped the background to almost entire black, and shifted the characters to the left, so that as the reader's eye moves left to right across the panel, it's almost as though the scene is fading to black. Page 22. This is a quick two-page scene change back to Kellen on Liam. Now, the two events that happen on these pages were written into the earlier scene, but I pushed them after the Dark Heather bits to add to the tension and cliffhang the issue a bit better. Panel 1. Let me tell you, writing out the onomatopoeia for the sound of a shattered bottle inside a basket isn't easy. On top of that, I needed it to be subtle enough that it worked both for the bottle and perhaps something else. Panel 2. The breaking of one of the two bottles of elixir was meant to add tension, and in some ways it does, since perhaps more than Rand could use it. And it's a gauge to just how cold those two mice must be if their bottles are shattering. But showing that Rand's most pressing ailment was poison, and not whatever Abigail was telling Gwendolyn, takes the pressure off this elixir being needed. Panel 3. I still had my beer bottle with the taped-on spruce tuck label handy from issue one, so I photographed myself holding it, just as Liam is here, for reference. Page 23. But Kelena doesn't think that sound was breaking glass. He thinks it's the scrim of ice atop the snow cracking as the owl lands. The choice to have the axis handle perfectly vertical in panel one is a really odd choice, and I don't know that I still agree with it, but... As in panel two, the mice are small, it is nice to have this tighter shot of Kelenoth. And in panel two, that is the very same owl seeking revenge, and it's made clear by the red wounded eye from issue one. It's ominous visually, but also clearer for storytelling purposes. And now that we've reached the end of the issue, a publishing note. The end of this issue marked an odd moment for Mouse Guard. After it was published, I was already well into writing and drawing issue four of Winter, but Archaea went through a really hard time, where it lost an investor and was not able to publish books or pay creators. And the wait between issues 3 and 4 was a long one, because not only did Archaea need to find a new owner and investor, but I had to do some serious contract work to make that new arrangement work for me. All the while, I couldn't say anything about the situation publicly, including when the next issue would come out, if ever. Now, this is long before Boom purchased Archaea, and luckily, it all worked out then, and now that Boom has purchased Archaea, it makes Archaea even more stable as a publisher than it ever has been before. Pin-up by Craig Rousseau. I knew Craig from the old Hellboy forums on the Comic Book Resources website, and I really enjoyed his work. When I asked Craig to do a pin-up for Winter, he wanted to show part of the Weasel War, but he asked me first specifically because he was worried that it would be doing something akin to, quote, revealing the identity of Boba Fett by showing the weasels before I got a chance to. I had no problem with it, and it worked out nicely with the flashback panels from this issue. Craig later went on to contribute a Legends of the Guard story that appears in Volume 1. And that's the third issue of Mouse Guard Winter 1152. It's been collected in a hardcover published by Archaea. If you've enjoyed this commentary, please leave comments in the section below. Let me know what I didn't answer for you in this issue, and subscribe for updates when I add more Mouse Guard commentary. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.